on the phone, Scott Lemieux. He is the uh, blogger from Lawyers, Guns, and Money, and also a contributor to uh, the American Prospect, uh, The Guardian. Uh, welcome to the program, Scott. Great to be back, Sam. Uh, so, all right, we had two cases yesterday. Uh, one was Halbig v. v uh, Burwell. Um, the right. second uh, was, was it King v. Burwell? I can't quite figure out. Yes, I've got it right here. It is, uh, um, hmm. I believe it is King v. Burwell, yes. Yeah, I just chose the first name. There were obviously multiple uh, plaintiffs. And, and Burwell, of course, is the... Um, uh, the Health and Human S uh, Services uh, d uh, Secretary. Uh, both these right. were at one point uh, v. Sebelius. Um, right. And uh, so uh, let's start with, I guess, uh, let's take this uh, in chronological order. The, the first case came out of the D.C. Uh, Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, right. which is um, highly relevant in terms of even a backstory. But, but first, let's go over the, the actual case. Right. Right. So the, the argument here is that there's a, um, there's a flaw in uh, the, the parts of the Affordable Care Act that um, set up the, um, the uh, insurance exchanges. So um, as, as probably most of your listeners are aware, um, you know, the Affordable Care Act has three prongs. So it's, um, you know, eventually it wants everybody within 138% of the poverty line to be eligible for Medicaid. Um, obviously, some people will be covered by their employers. For the people who are in between, that is, people who, you know, don't, aren't covered by their employers but aren't eligible for Medicaid, um, the ACA sets up insurance exchanges. So now, obviously, for people who are non-affluent, might not be able to afford um, insurance, um, you know, particularly since the insurance now actually has to cover things, you know, it can't be dropped for people with pre-existing conditions. So um, the system is set up where people are required to buy insurance, but, um, you know, there are fairly generous subsidies for the non-affluent to purchase um, insurance. And the, so, the, these the, are in the form of, of tax credits, uh, I believe. And, uh, right, that's correct. This is from 133% of poverty up to 400% of poverty. Yeah, that's correct, right. So, and I think that that's about $85,000 a year at the top end, something like that. Um, and so, um, you know, the literal language of the statute makes it seem as if these credits are available only on state exchanges and not on federal exchanges. So what happened is that, um, you know, the ACA is kind of a, a sop to, you know, some conservative Democrats in the Senate whose votes were needed, um, you know, gave the states sort of the first option of establishing these exchanges. But Congress correctly anticipated that there would be a lot of uh, resistance at the state level, if not quite as much as happened. So it allowed the federal government to step in and create exchanges where the state government wouldn't. So if you, there's a, a phrase in isolation that if you read it in isolation, makes it look like the subsidies are available only on the state exchanges and not on the federal exchanges. So a suit was brought essentially arguing that the federal government has to stop issuing the tax credits um, you know, to um, people who um, obtain insurance on federal exchanges. The IRS, however, has reje you know, rejected that interpretation. So the case came up because the IRS issued a rule saying, of course, Congress intended to, the tax credits to be available to, to both, um, that, you know, when it said state exchanges, you know, obviously the federal government was establishing state exchanges. So that's, that's essentially the conflict, that conservatives are arguing that the, the credits are available only on state exchanges. The IRS argued that they should be available to both. And um, in this instance, the, the theory of the plaintiffs was, if I'm not mistaken, was that um, Congress set it up this way because they wanted to cajole states into uh, basically setting up their own exchanges. And therefore, by saying that uh, these tax credits are only available to states that establish their own exchange, uh, this would cajole, I guess, presumably, um, according to the plaintiffs, uh, the theory was that Congress had was that it would uh, it would cajole every state to do this, um, which I mean, that's their legal argument. Right. I mean, that I mean, because, or, or is it or is it that they don't even have to argue as to what the intent was? 
Right. Well, there's two arguments. I mean, I just, I just kind of wrote about this, lawyers, guns, and money, but there's two potential arguments. To me, the slightly less bad one is to say that maybe Congress intended for the subsidies to be available on the federal exchanges, but that's not what they wrote. So tough luck. You know, wh- whatever the results that are produced, you know, we have to read the language literally. Now, for reasons we might get into, I think that's a really bad argument, a really bad way of reading the statute, but I can sort of understand that. But the argument you describe, I've actually seen from more people, that their their conservatives arguing that Congress actually intended for the subsidies not to be available on the federal exchanges. But the argument just collapses on itself because, you know, if Congress assumed that all the states would go along in establishing exchanges, why would they bother to give the federal government the power to, ex- to create exchanges in the first place? Um, and in addition to that, why would they have initially structured the Medicaid expansion so that, you know, states, you know, had to get the, you know, take the expansion or lose all their funding? Everything about the way the ACA was structured assumed that some states would not go along, which, when you saw the Republican opposition, I think was pretty obvious. Right. <laughs> um, you know, that I'm not sure that they anticipated the scale of it. I would guess that probably, you know, Congressional Democrats might have thought there would be 35 state exchanges rather than 19, but nonetheless, they obviously anticipated this problem. So to argue that Congress, you know, but I think that the, the and, other and I should add, issue here, I should add, it's also not just a function of whether or not there is a a hostile, um, uh, you know, a hostile uh, uh, state the legislature or uh, a governor to uh, the setting up of state exchanges, but in fact that there are some states that simply just didn't feel like they could get their act together to do it. Yeah, that's a great point, too, that, that unlike the Medicaid expansion, which is an exclusively Republican thing, that some states, you know, there, there are states that were perfectly supportive of, of the ACA that, that just were unable or unwilling to set up their own exchanges. So that's 100, yeah, that's entirely correct. And again, something was foreseen. And to me, the really strange thing about the argument that you describe is that Republicans seem to think that the primary purpose of the subsidies was to provide incentives for state governments. But that's, you know, the primary purpose for subsidies was to enable people to get medical insurance. <laughs> you know, that it's, it's that, you know, the, the people seem to be losing sight of the fact that the Affordable Care Act was not written by Republicans. It was written by people who wanted to increase access to medical care. Right. It wasn't like an obscure states' rights minutia thing. And, and it's just so that, you know, it's just it's bizarre to me watching Republicans try to get in, the, you know, try to, you know, understand the goals of the Affordable Care Act. As I wrote today, it's, it's like watching an, an elephant try to play a toy piano. Like, they sort of try <laughs> to understand, but they can't really do it. It's not really, well, they, it's they also, really know what's going I on. mean, I think, you know, you may give them more credit than I do in terms of being uh, genuine and sincere in, in that analysis. I mean, because right. because the theory would have to go something like this, right, that we're going to cajole the the states into offering subsidies. Otherwise, their citizens will be forced to buy health insurance. They won't get subsidies. They'll look at the other states that have exchanges. They'll be upset. They will take it out on the politicians uh, in that instance, which, of course, flies in the face of every decision by every state uh, uh, governor that rejected the Medicaid expansion. Yeah, right. and, and, and the Medicaid expansion is much stronger because, you know, the states have really no direct incentive to set up their own exchanges, whereas the Medicaid expansion, they're literally leaving huge amounts of money on the table, and they're still not taking it. You know, so the idea that, you know, that, oh, well, you know, some, you know, if, if some, you know, constituents are getting screwed, then states will have no choice but to go along. Um, you know, that doesn't make any sense, and there's also no evidence that that was the theory of the drafters of the, of the ACA. Again, if that was the theory, I can't explain why they had the provision to allow the federal government to set up exchanges at all. Wouldn't the better way of, is just saying there are state exchanges and either the state set them up or we don't. Like, but that's, that's not what Congress did. So the theory just has, you know, and, and so I want to be clear about this. I'm not saying that um, we should be governed by what legislators subjectively intended rather than what they wrote. What I'm saying is that you, you have to look at a statute as a whole. You know, you can't look at isolated phrases of the statute. You have to read them in context. And everything about the structure of the Affordable Care Act suggests that the D.C. Circuit is wrong. It just, it just doesn't make any – it just – reading it that way is just contrary to the basic structure and the basic goals of the legislation. All right, it's well, just a senseless reading. Okay. Well, let, so, I mean, so, so, so just to reset here the the uh, the 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 court uh, 
found which argument did they they rule on? In other words, did they say um, it's clear the intent was this and that's why they set it up? Or was it uh, did the court find that, like, look, we're not in a position. And and it seems to me this is their argument. We're not in a position to divine what uh, Congress wanted and or we can't tell what Congress wanted, so we just have to go by the the strict construction, the, the what the text itself says in this one sentence. Yeah, they just basically the the opinion sort of although you know they kind of hinted at some reasons why congress may have wanted to do that they, they were essentially agnostic on the question that they sort of so where some pundits have said congress may well have intended this they just sort of said you know that you know we we at least can't assume that that's what congress wanted so i would say that they were more more the latter that they were just kind of agnostic saying that you know we're not quite sure what congress wanted to do but basically the plain language of the statute says only on state exchanges, and there's not enough evidence to overcome that. So that they didn't really have to make a strong argument about intent. They basically assumed the burden of proof was on um, the government, and the government failed to make it, which is sort of a striking contrast with the with the Fourth Circuit opinion. All right. Well, yeah. Let's so um, let's let's go to the Fourth Circuit because um, uh, it, it seems to me that um, the uh, the. The, the, the D.C. Circuit said there's no real indication of congressional intent, uh, whereas the Fourth Circuit said uh, wh- the, the intent was unclear, but because it's ambiguous, it's going to defer essentially to the IRS's uh, interpretation of the statute. Is that, is that right. a fair assessment? Yeah, so there were two arguments made by the Fourth Circuit. So the majority opinion, yeah, so that they relied on what's known as the Chevron Doctrine, um, based on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a sort of administrative case. And what that doctrine is, is that if, you know, an administrative agency um, issues a ruling, the court should defer to it unless it is plainly wrong. So the, the majority, the, the, or the unanimous panel of the Fourth Circuit, they all said essentially that, you know, the, the federal government's interpretation is at least plausible. And the majority said, we think that the government's interpretation is probably better than that of the plaintiffs, but, but they said it was close, but that essentially that if it's ambiguous, then you have to err on the side of the federal agency. So that according to the Fourth Circuit, had the IRS ruled the other way, it would have deferred to them on that. But since the IRS interpreted the statute in a way that was reasonable, then you have to defer to that. So whereas the D.C. Circuit saw the burden of proof being on the government, the Fourth Circuit saw the burden of proof of being on on the people attacking the legislation, essentially saying, you have to show clearly that the interpretation was wrong. And if you look at the you know, statutory provision in context, then it's not clearly wrong. It's at, at, at the minimum plausible. Um, so there was, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So there was also a really interesting concurring opinion, which basically said that was actually being too generous to the lawsuit, essentially that, in fact, it is completely clear that the subsidies were supposed to be available on the federal level, that it's not even ambiguous that if you just look at the structure of the statute, it's obvious that, you know, that when the federal government established, you know, exchanges for the states, those were effectively state exchanges, that there are plenty of other parts of the statute that assume that the subsidies will be available to both. There's nothing to contradict predicts that so that he almost went further than that just saying that this isn't even a close question that you know essentially you know it's obvious that the irs's interpretation was right the the rest of the panel was a little more circumspect they said well you know reasonable people can disagree but if reasonable people can disagree you have to defer to the irs's judgment all right let's take that i mean that 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 um that uh the argument that it's it's quite obvious i mean I mean, even the, the notion of established by the state, I'm not even sure what that means, uh, you know, in, in the sense that, like, as far as I know, when you go to your state's exchange, it is not clear that it is being administered by the federal government. I mean, what what the, what does it yeah. did anybody sort of tackle that question of what it means to establish uh, an exchange on a uh, you know which is basically a website. I mean, 
Yeah, that was basically that was that was kind of central to Justice Davis's concurrence, the, the Fourth Circuit concurrence, basically saying that the structure of the, of the legislation makes it obvious that when the federal government, you know, establishes an exchange, they're doing it on behalf of the state. You know, that it, that that it's effectively still a state exchange. That the federal government is taking some of the administrative responsibilities, but it essentially they're all state exchanges, as you say. Whether it's federally or state administered, states are going onto you know citizens of the state go onto the marketplace. It's set up only for their state. It doesn't cross state lines. There's no effective difference. And so that's what exactly that if you look at that established, you know, you know, the, the, the exchanges established by the state governments, you just have to look at it as, you know, whoever does the administrative work, that's what's what's meant. It's, you know, the exchange that the state citizens go on. So there's just no reason, you know, and, and so now obviously in isolation, you know, you could read it either way. But, you know, in the context of the statute as a whole, it's just blindingly obvious what it means. It's it, not, you know, that, and, you know, just, it, so. and that's one of the things that struck me about um, about the uh, the the uh, D.C. circuits. Um, uh, holding is that at one point um, uh, I, I, let me ha- find that quote at one point um, the uh, the uh, I, I'm not sure if it was Griffith or uh, the other judge we should we, we will talk about the sort of the 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 fact that it was just a panel from that court uh, right. but they said um, that we're not in a position uh, because uh, we, we want to take um, uh, we want to take this language as it is uh, because we don't want to be in a position of changing the essentially the intent intent of Congress uh, when they wrote this statute. And, and so they're trying to it seems to me that this is sort of like this is this is pretending not to be activist in the way that they talk about being activist. But in fact, is very activist in that they are. It's, it seems to me clearly thwarting uh, Congress's intent. But they are arguing that we are simply in a position of upholding uh, Congress's intent. Like yeah, they're that, not those... acknowledging that this could that this was a mistake. They're saying that this was uh, a very uh, specific use of language, and therefore we're holding out the intent. But that's like that's like, I mean. Theoretically, if you're going to isolate one sentence from an entire statute, you could also just isolate one word and try and divine the intent from that one word, right? Yeah, it's just that, that I'm glad you talked about that because the, those last passages in Griffith's opinion, this sort of folk, you know, oh, we know millions of people are going to lose their insurance, we're really reluctant, but, you know, we have no choice but to be restrained and uphold the will of the legislature. I mean, it's just, as, as one commenter at our site said, it's sort of like, you know, the judge in Caddyshack saying that we didn't want to sentence all those teenagers to death, but he felt that he owed it to them. <laughs> it was sort of the same thing, you know, it's just, it just ridiculous. Um, you know, to try to say, so this idea that he's upholding the will of Congress over the administration branch is just you know remarkably right. disingenuous right because here's the, the quote that, here's the quote that you actually pull um yeah. uh, uh, the the majority writes our ruling will likely have significant consequences both for the millions of individuals receiving tax credits through the federal <laughs> exchanges and for health insurance markets more broadly but uh it, it's our job as uh, ensuring that policy is made by elected politically accountable representatives not by appointed life tenure judges i mean <laughs> when you say that it implies that what you need to do is dig into the intent of the statute and no one could possibly imagine that was the intent if you did no investigation of uh, of the intent but it seems that everybody involved in the drafting says that's just a patently absurd. Why would we write in a poison pill to our own legislation when the stated goals are quite obvious? Yeah, the, you know, the, here's the thing. The people who voted for the Affordable Care Act wanted the subsidy and the exchanges to work. They didn't want them to fail. That's, you know, and that's why what's amazing about this is that allegedly the courts are upholding the will of Congress, but if anybody can identify any support of the Affordable Care Act inside or outside Congress who accepts this interpretation, that's the first one. You know, like there's nobody believes this who doesn't hate the ACA. And it's not surprising since, you know, it's just hostility to the idea of insuring people is just embedded within all these arguments that they sort of assume 
that Congress wanted these exchanges to fail for something having to do with state power or something like that. But that's just that's not how anybody who supported the Affordable Care Act thinks. That's not their priority. That you know that it's just basically a big case of projection. <laughs> that essentially, you know, we don't care about uninsuring people. We care about making you know a bunch of stuff about federal and state power. So obviously that's what the supporters of the Affordable Care Act cared about. It's a sort of standing, you know, as I said, it's literally interpreting the law to defeat its own purposes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's basically it. You'd have to, I mean, the it, it, it simply doesn't, it, it is, I mean, I hate saying this stuff because it's, it's, it's so often misused, but this flies in the face of common sense in the most fundamental way. Like, I, I hate the use of the words, you know, it's not a common sense ruling, but this really does, I mean, this really is just, uh, uh, this is, this is bizarro world uh, where, where supporters of the Affordable Care Act would, I mean, because no one anticipated that every single state would set up their own exchange. No one at any point during the, all of this. And so basically Congress would have had to have written a law where they would have specifically excluded at least one segment of the population, which makes no sense to do this at all. Right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It's just what, what the argument can explain is why Congress bothered to give the federal government the power to set up exchanges. You know, if they wanted to have the number of the states, like, that just doesn't make any sense at all. That the only reason to give the federal government that power is if you want them to be able to set up the same exchanges that the states otherwise would have. There's just, there's no other, you know, there's, just, there's no reason to give the federal government the power to do something that everybody concedes won't work. <laughs> it just doesn't, you know, it's just, it's just you know, and, and as I said, it's not, you know, I think the, the, the um, concurring opinion in the Fourth Circuit put it very well. This isn't really a debate about, you know, textualism or purposivism or, you know, like no good way of reading statutes would read this, reach this conclusion. You know, everybody on some level is a textualist, but that doesn't mean that you just look at random isolated phrases. You know, right. any competent reading of a statute looks at it as a whole. So you might call that common sense, but it's just basic. There's just 101 statutory interpretation. You know, you don't, you know, focus on individual phrases. You try to make sense of it. You know, how does this relate to, you know, the other passages? How does this relate to the stated goals of the legislation? And the basic way around that of the people applauding this decision is to substitute their own goals and their own priorities from the authors of the legislation. But that, that can't work. And, you know, and you and have to is, infer the intent from the legislation, not from your own views. And, and this is so obvious. I mean, I mean, this is also like, I mean, this is sort of like a basic tenet of even like contract law, too. Right. I mean, you could have oh, two right. provisions that may um, that may uh, 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 contradict each other. And so you try and look at what the intent or what the sense is, what the two parties have had an understanding of. And in this case, it's quite clear what, at the very least, Congress had in its mind. All right. So let's talk about uh, Ian Mailheiser has done a very good job of um, that. And you mentioned in your piece of uh, of introducing us to these two uh, uh, Republican uh, George Bush appointed uh, uh, judges. Who yeah, sit, I should mention one by by Bush pair and one by Bush uh, son, but yes, but 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 both both by a George George Bush. Right, and uh, and and maybe uh, the next one will be from uh, from Jeb. Who knows? But oh. uh, down the road. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it, 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 before we get to that, I actually I did have one more uh, point about the Chevron, sure. uh, the the citation of Chevron in the Fourth Circuit. One thing to note, and I don't think it would be that much of a problem because we're that much further down the road, but when President Cruz um, uh, gets into office, uh, he could very well say to uh, his, uh, you know, his newly appointed um, uh, di director of the IRS, uh, who, I, I don't know, maybe it's Daryl Issa, um, you know, hey, you should revisit uh, whether or not those tax credits, right, are, are, are valid for the state exchanges, right, under the under the way that the uh, the the Fourth Circuit ruled, at least in its in the majority. Yeah, and that's one you know always where you know when when a few people were trying to argue that the 2012 election didn't really matter, you know, one argument was, well, you know, the Democrats might control the Senate, so you can't really do anything to the Affordable Care Act. And what people don't understand is that there's all kinds of things a president could do to hobble the Affordable Care Act administratively, like, you know, that if you're determined to do it. Now, the only difference may be that, you know, I would say that the, the more entrenched the Affordable Care Act becomes, right. the harder it would be for President Cruz to do that. And one thing here, one difference to 
in this and Medicaid is that, you know, the people who get eligible for these tax credits are not rich, but they're middle class people. You know, we're not dealing with, you know, the, the sort of poorest, um, you know, sort of least politically powerful elements of society. So the more and more people that come to rely on this, it, it would be tougher for a president to just say, you know, and more and more people get the insurance. It'll be tougher for a president to say, whoops, you know, you 20 right. or 30 million people, no insurance for you. That, um, you know, that it's, it's sort of, you know, that it's one thing in a conservative state, but a president who has to appeal to a national constituency. So it could still happen, but it's a lot easier for the Republicans if the courts do their dirty work for them. Indeed. You know, nobody can be held accountable. Right. A president could do that, but there really are political disincentives. And again, the political disincentives get more and more the more this legislation becomes entrenched you know that just like social security that a lot of conservatives have wanted to get rid of it but the more constituents that rely on it the harder it is so i do think that's a concern but you know the, the longer it goes it, it's much harder for a, a republican president to do that than it would be for the courts to do that right that and, and the, so, the best way to make it work is to have the judiciary do it so so let's look forward and see if the courts will will will, uh, will do what president cruz uh, would would be hesitant to do um, so now there is a uh, three person panel now the, the the interesting thing about this um, is that uh, only, and I guess it was like six to eight months ago, um, the Republicans were refusing to confirm any nominees to this court uh, because they felt that, uh, because the full court has 11 members, they felt that was too many. They're really, right. you know, they're, they're just sitting around, they're not doing enough work. We could save some money, I guess, or whatever it is with the three judges. Right. So they didn't want to confirm any of them. Uh, and then the uh, the uh, the Senate Democrats finally decided, hey, maybe we should reform the filibuster so that we can actually fill some vacancies. Uh, they did. Those um, those nominees were confirmed. There are now 11 uh, justices, uh, judges on that court. Uh, and that has huge implications going forward. Tell us. Right. So so one thing is that, yeah, that, that it's enormously that assuming that the administration um, petitions for what's called an on-bank hearing, that is, you know, a hearing in front of the entire D.C. Circuit, what would happen is that you'd have those 11 plus the two senior justices who were part of this panel. So it would be, I believe, an 8-5 um, Democratic um, advantage. And again, as we've already discussed, essentially no Buddy who is not a conservative Republican is going to be persuaded by these arguments. So if it goes to a non-bank panel, thanks to the Senate finally, you know, ab abolishing the filibuster on um, on on, a, on these appellate nominees, um, you know, that it's almost certain that this this ruling will be over uh, overruled. And that's significant because if that happens, the Supreme Court could just decide not to hear the case. As it stands now, the Supreme Court would almost have to hear it because you have a circuit split. All right. So yeah. No. Explain that. Explain that, that to people yeah. because I because I, right. I I think the the layperson doesn't understand the implications of a circuit split. Right. So the key here is that one of the the areas in which the Supreme Court is most likely to agree to hear a case is when. Um, you know, circuit courts disagree about the interpretation. So that if if every court you know to have heard the case, every court appeals to heard the case agrees, then the Supreme Court only has a reason to intervene if it thinks somebody is clearly wrong. You know, but other than that, it can just let it stand. But generally, when it comes to major legislation, the courts are reluctant to allow one circuit to rule one way and one circuit to rule the other way because that creates a lot of confusion. You know, what you know, what's the law going forward? Because remember, there are you know thirty states that have federally administered exchanges, there's going to be lawsuits, and all these courts are going to try to have to evaluate, you know, which, which argument do we think is more likely to buy. So if there's a split, the Supreme Court can't l really let that stand. If, on the other hand, both the D.C. Circuit and the Fourth Circuit have said, you know, the IRS um, the ruling is sound, the Supreme Court could just decide, we don't really want to deal with this, um, you know, so that that's one possibility. So that, that, you know, that as it stands now, the Supreme Court would almost have to intervene, but assume that the D.C. Circuit overrules this panel's ruling, then the Supreme Court may just decide to stay out of it. Although I would say that under those circumstances, if the Supreme Court takes the case, that's not a good sign. <laughs> right. OK. Well, I mean, and that's that's that, that's the thing here, too, is right that we know that that, um, you know, uh, w the 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 era in which I think people were naive as to um, the uh, just how sort of, I guess, um, uh, ideologically driven a court can be uh, has, has long since gone. 
Uh, and so this court, uh, if they felt, I mean, it's interesting because Roberts uh, at least likes to have some type of fig leaf to pretend that he is actually that uh, balls and strikes umpire uh, right. that he promised as he would be. And, and uh, few believed or at least, um, well, unfortunately, the ones who voted on it did believe or wanted to believe. Right. Uh, but right. it would make it much harder uh, for him to maintain that fig leaf to accept this case. Um, uh, if um, if the uh, the the full court uh, basically ruled in uh, consistently with the Fourth Circuit, however, doesn't it only take four justices to grant certification? And we know who those four justices would be, right? I mean. Well, it's tricky because the one thing about granting cert is that you only want the court to take the case if you think you're going to win. So one thing that makes makes it tricky is that you're right that you only need four, but, but you only want to take the case if you think that you're going to get a favorable outcome. So in some sense, it requires the sort of, you know, three – you know, liberals on the court, or, or sorry, the you know the four liberals on the court who will clearly vote to, to uphold the IRS rule, and there are three conservatives who I think would be guaranteed to vote um, to, to uphold the current D.C. Circuit panel: um, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito. So it's really about how those blocks perceive Roberts and Kennedy as being likely to vote. <laughs> you know, so that um, so that you know that that you know that you'll only get four people agree to hear the case if they think they'll get a favorable outcome. Right now, you know, now, so now that, sometimes uh, people make miscalculations. I mean, there's a lot of th- theory that Alito made a miscalculation uh, in terms of Harris v. Quinn, right? And this is the um, right. this is the uh, uh, the ruling about the, the 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 fair share payments, and everybody assumed that he would that 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 he thought he could get um, uh, a, a a greater majority to to actually strike down fair share payments as opposed to having to sort of like technically uh, sort of uh, decide well these people just aren't eligible. Uh, just aren't uh, eligible to be uh, uh, held to that standard. All right, well, then let me also ask you this. How would, if the Supreme Court ultimately takes this case, how could they reconcile the idea of of what they did with the Voting Rights Act? Because it seems to me that uh, during the Voting Rights Act, when they gutted uh, Section, I guess it was Section 4, uh, right, yeah. Which was the calculation of how uh, of who is already um, who's already subject to preclearance by the Department of Justice, uh, and this was a law that was reauthorized as late as I think it was 2006 or 2007. Yeah. And Scalia actually said, I think it was Scalia said, "Look, it is just too hard for these uh, senators to vote against." Uh, you know, the interests of of black privilege or where, however he phrased it. Right. Um, yeah. And so we're going to send it back to them. I mean, completely, com- completely reversing. I mean, uh, the the intent of Congress there. Uh, how, how could he then say, well, it was the intent of Congress here, despite the fact that it's going to have uh, bad implications? I mean, uh, how would he reconcile that? Or did you just say, you know, F it. I just watched uh, Fox last night, and I don't need to reconcile, you know, crap. Well, I guess they can reconcile pretty easily in saying that both those decisions would reflect an essential contempt of Congress. <laughs> you know, that, that basically just not taking, you know, that Shelby County is just kind of a remarkable decision in a lot of ways. Um, as my colleague said, it's the worst opinion he's ever read, and he's read Bush versus Gore. <laughs> like, just right. the, you know, that it really is just, like, I still, having read it several times, don't understand why it was unconstitutional or what part of the Constitution was violated, but it really just reflected a Essentially, that you know, Congress did held all these hearings and came to a formula, and we don't care. Like that, that doesn't sound good to us, and we're just going to substitute our own policy judgment. And this would effectively be the same thing. <laughs> you know, that rather than trying to understand what Congress is actually trying to do, you just read that isolated phrase. You know, you you know, interpret it based on your own goals and your own priorities, and just essentially, you know, throw out. Um, the will of Congress in the name of upholding the will of Congress, which is the really remarkable twist about this, that, you know, that, you know pretending that you're, you're up, up, upholding Congress over the executive branch when you're actually doing no such thing, um, you know, when they're trying to work together to, to make the law work. So, you know, and that's why I, I know most court watchers think that, that the Supreme Court would vote to uphold the IRS rule and not eliminate the exchanges. And they may very well be right. Um, I can see an argument that if Roberts wanted the Affordable Care Act gone, he would have done it um, in 2012 <laughs> before people came to rely on it. So, but having said that, it's just I, I just can't be as confident. You know, I just right. I don't know what 
they're going to do because I just don't put anything past this court. Right. I, I just, in 1999, I see, the idea. County, I don't see how you can. Right. In 1999, uh, Bush v. Gore was sort of, right. I mean, was would have been shocking to the conscience of nearly, uh, n- never mind ideologi- uh, uh, ideological stripes, uh, I think would have been shocking to the conscience, uh, uh, to the conscience of, of just about everybody who, who followed that stuff. Um, right. All right, so lastly, let me just finish with this, because, because that, uh, that, that change in the filibuster rule that the, the Senate right. Democrats had, it really it could play out in such a huge, huge manner, it seems to me, um, that um, we should say that since that time, um, there has been a lot of judicial appointments, right? I mean, the yeah. it, it, that it was incredibly effective, not just in this instance, but but across the board. Yeah, that was really, and I was, you know, I, this goes back a long way that I was arguing, you know, um, that the the Democrats should have filibustered Alito, not because I thought they could have stopped them, but because basically the Republicans would have used the nuclear option, eliminated the, you know, and then at least eliminated the filibuster on executive and judicial branch appointees. And I think once you do that, you sort of put the filibuster in general on the road to extinction. So that, you know, you think about how different things would have been in 2009 if, you know, Obama had more leeway over appointments and perhaps, you know, Democrats could have gotten frustrated enough to just eliminate the filibuster altogether. So it was belated, but it's good that, you know, finally, and I think the D.C. Circuit thing really came to a head, is that there's some, even liberal Democrats like Pat Leahy, you know, not necessarily, con- you know, conservative Democrats, are just very attached to Senate traditions. Right. But it was the Republican announcement that it's not that we object to any of these one nominees, but we're, just, we're in principle opposed to Obama making any more appointments to the powerful D.C. Circuit because we control it. So I think they just said enough is enough. You know, right. Trying to play these gentlemanly rules in a context in which it's not about individual candidates, but just we don't think that the president of the United States should be able to use his appointment power. <laughs> you know, that just wasn't, you know, even though we don't even control the Senate. Um, you know, so I think that that was really important. That that you know, and and I think that might have actually been a miscalculation on McConnell's part. Now maybe he had good reason to think that he would get bailed out again, but you know, at some point it was going to break. <laughs> you know that, um, and I never thought that Reid was the reason the filibuster wasn't abolished. Um, I think that Reed just, he doesn't act until he has the votes. You know, he's smart right. that way. I think it was much more about Leahy and a, and, a, and a few of the, or Leahy and a few of the sort of older guard um, Democrats who just didn't really want to abolish the tradition. Right, the so that is actually race. a very right. significant thing, because as I said, without that, um, you know, the D.C. Circuit probably upholds this ruling, and the Supreme Court has to take the case. And I, I think the best case scenario is the Supreme Court not touching this. You know, I just don't want anything to, to happen. I will, uh, do you have a sense, and, and uh, you know, uh, we, we got to wrap here up here, but do you have a sense that when they were making this argument that 11 is just too much, too much on that court, which I just found hysterical, yeah. um, that they were that they were actually thinking, you know, I mean, that, you know, maybe they didn't think they would succeed in that argument, but that they were actually thinking like, hey, this this case is coming down the pike. Um, this we may not want uh, 11 just we may not want the government to be able to go to this court on banc and win. Yeah. Well, and that's because the, the D.C. Circuit is, you know, and some of your listeners may not know this, is hugely important because it hears these kinds of administrative law cases. So, for example, you know, when there's a legal challenge to the new EPA regulations, right. it'll probably go through the D.C. Circuit. So, you know, that, that it's a very important p- court, especially since there are a lot of opinions that the Supreme Court doesn't review, so that it really makes a big difference how, you know, so that particularly in modern government where so much policymaking is done by the executive branch, who controls the D.C. Circuit is hugely important. So that was a really high-stakes battle that the Republicans just wanted, you know, they had a Republican advantage on that circuit, and they wanted to keep it that way until there was another Republican president. So it was a real high-stakes battle, and I think that's what finally motivated Senate Democrats to say, enough is enough. <laughs> you know, that that's just, we're not, we're not going to allow the serial obstruction of nominees to the circuit, including, you know, very moderate, very qualified, it's just it's that, that we're not going to tolerate that. And this could have really big consequences because again three years ago this panel would have been upheld now it's almost certain not to be um, I, I cannot I, I would I'd be willing to wager a substantial amount of money that, that this opinion is vacated by by the en banc like and, I just, there's, it's not going to persuade anybody who's not a conservative Republican and, and it's 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 impossible to imagine the administration wouldn't appeal uh, now, let me ask you this is there uh, uh, it wouldn't appeal to the entire court but is it possible that um, 
that in some way the plaintiffs could take this directly, uh, could could seek certification from the Supreme Court before the entire uh, um, uh, uh, D.C. Circuit Court could hear it or no? You see, I, now I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but you know, I was sort of was trying to research that this morning. I mean, normally I would think that the Supreme Court, um, you know, would, would do wait. that only if the losing party was was petitioning for cert. But so I think that it would have to come down to you know if the Obama administration decides it wants to go right to the court. But I don't know why it would do that. I guess the Supreme Court could sort of grant cert any time it wants. So I suppose that you know if the uh, you know the the plaintiffs were just to appeal directly to the court, they could take the case. But my understanding. Thing, um, if I understand correctly, is that that would be highly unusual. That they would generally let the process played out. That you know that if the loser wants to forego an on bank, that's fine. But they generally wouldn't do it because the winner wants to avoid an on bank. But uh, I don't. I don't think anything. I don't think there are any rules that would forbid that. It's more about good practices. Um, so and again, I'm not. You know, th- it's a tricky question. So I'm not. You know, if, if somebody disagrees with me, then then defer to their judgment. Um, use use the Chevron doctrine. <laughs> but uh, but that my understanding is that they could. But it would be unusual. All right. If I understand correctly. Uh, Scott Lemieux, thank you so much um, uh, for this uh, uh, a great breakdown and uh, just a, a fascinating story to see the implications of of what that filibuster um, uh, d- uh, reform did uh, uh, this far down the line. It's a it's a, it's a great sort of illustration of uh, of the impact of something like that. Yeah, a lot, a lot of different themes of, of the last four years in politics coming together yesterday. Indeed. Uh, Scott Lemieux, uh, Lawyers, Guns, and Money. We'll put a link up uh, to your piece in The Guardian and, of course, to your blog. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Sam. Talk to you again soon.